Welcome to American Parkinson Disease Association's presentation, Parkinson's Disease, The Essentials. I'm Rebecca Gilbert, Chief Scientific Officer at American Parkinson Disease Association, or APDA for short. This presentation is an overview of Parkinson's disease, or PD, its symptoms, risk factors, and treatments. It is also an overview of how to manage well with this disease and how APDA can help. Please remember that any medical information provided is solely for the purpose of providing information and is not intended as medical advice. Before we begin, there are a few important points that I would like to highlight about PD. First of all, there has been tremendous progress over the past number of years in our understanding of PD and developments of treatments for PD. Our motto at APDA, strength and optimism, hope and progress, guides us every day. In addition, PD is highly individualized from person to person, so not everything that is discussed today is relevant for everyone listening. PD impacts not only the person, but his or her family, social networks, and community at large. And the healthcare team taking care of someone with PD must be familiar with signs and symptoms, treatment strategies, and how PD impacts an individual patient. Finally, treating PD requires a team approach. To put Parkinson's disease in historical context, you are looking at the first page of a manuscript written by Dr. James Parkinson in 1817 called Essay on the Shaking Palsy. This is the first medical description of what became named Parkinson's disease. With that as background, let us begin our discussion of what is Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a brain disorder that can affect a person's ability to perform common daily activities. Symptoms of PD are generally divided into motor symptoms, those that affect movement, and non-motor symptoms, those that do not involve movement, such as sleep disorders, constipation, and depression. Motor symptoms of PD are typically due to a lack of a brain chemical called dopamine. The substantia nigra is an area deep within the brain that communicates with other areas of the brain using the brain chemical dopamine. Proper dopamine signaling is critical to produce normal movement. The cells of the substantia nigra degenerate in PD, leading to a lack of dopamine and difficulty with movement. Many other types of nerve cells in the brain degenerate in PD as well, which cause many of the non-motor symptoms. The primary motor symptoms, which are part of PD and can be used to diagnose Parkinson's disease, are tremor, and this typically happens when a body part is at rest, rigidity or stiffness of movement, and bradykinesia, slowness of movement. Finally, there is postural instability or difficulty maintaining balance. We often think of the motor symptoms of PD like the part of the iceberg above the water. These are the symptoms that are visible to other people. The non-motor symptoms are the part of the iceberg beneath the water. These symptoms are not visible, but nonetheless can be very problematic. Not all non-motor symptoms occur in everyone with PD, and the severity varies from person to person as well. Non-motor symptoms of PD are typically divided into three major categories, neuropsychiatric, sensory, and autonomic. Neuropsychiatric symptoms include problems of mood, sleep, and thinking. Sensory symptoms can include pain, as well as changes in vision and smell. Autonomic symptoms involve functions of the, of the body that are not controlled consciously, like blood pressure regulation and urination. There may be other less common non-motor features that are not listed here. Here is a summary of Parkinson's disease statistics. In the United States, there are approximately 1 million people with Parkinson's disease, with 60,000 new cases diagnosed each year. This means that someone is diagnosed every nine minutes. The average age of onset is approximately 60, and approximately 10% of Parkinson's disease cases develop before the age of 50. And when this occurs, it's called young onset Parkinson's disease. Men are 50% more likely to get Parkinson's disease than women. 
A study in 2019 calculated the economic burden of PD in the United States. Over $50 billion is spent every year with one half shouldered by the government and one half shouldered by people with PD in the form of co-pays, lost wages, and other out-of-pocket expenses. Here is the risk factors for PD. There's a male to female ratio of diagnosis of three to two. That means men are 50% more likely to get PD than women. There are also environmental and genetic risk factors that we will discuss in a moment. And finally, age is a risk factor with incidence of PD increasing with age. Over 20 genes have been associated with PD and many more have yet to be identified. Currently, most people with PD do not have one of the known gene mutations already identified to increase PD risk. For these people, having a first degree relative with PD modestly increases a person's risk of developing PD. As we understand more and more about genes that contribute to PD risk, we will be able to increase our understanding of who may develop PD. Certain environmental toxins, such as particular pesticides, have been implicated in increased PD risk. Traumatic brain injury can increase risk as well. It's important to note that genes and environment work together to affect PD risk, and some environmental factors may be more significant in those with particular gene mutations. This slide illustrates the most widely recommended treatments for PD, medications, physical occupational and speech therapy, and deep brain stimulation. We will now discuss each of these. Here are some important points about medications. A lot of current research is focused on finding a therapy that protects neurons from degeneration in PD, but this type of treatment is not yet available. Available treatments help to control the symptoms of PD. The goal of medication management is to get the right dose without too many side effects. Regular adjustment of the dose and the timing of medications are key to effective treatment. Because each person is different and we process medications differently, the responses to the medications may be different. PD may best be treated with a combination of medications as each medication has a different effect on the brain. The next few slides are tables of all the available medications for Parkinson's disease in the United States. Of note, this list was updated as of July 2020, and new medications may have been approved since then. The first category is different formulations of levodopa, a chemical which gets converted to dopamine in the brain. Most of these formulations also contain carbidopa, which prevents levodopa's breakdown in the bloodstream. In this way, more of the levodopa can cross into the brain where it is converted to dopamine. The different formulations are immediate release, extended release, orally disintegrating, intestinal gel, and inhalation powder. Levodopa remains the gold standard of treatment for PD and is typically the most effective medication in treating the motor symptoms of PD. It must be emphasized that levodopa is not toxic and does not cause faster progression of PD. This is a common misunderstanding. COMT inhibitors are another class of medications which prevent the breakdown of levodopa in the bloodstream. COMT inhibitors must be taken along with levodopa. Anticholinergic medications improve dopamine signaling in the brain. However, they can have many side effects, including effects on thinking and memory. They are therefore used sparingly, particularly in older populations. Dopamine agonists mimic dopamine in the brain. They are available in many formulations, short-acting, long-acting, injectable, patch, and most recently, sublingual film. They need to be used carefully in the elderly due to potential side effects. Adenosine 2A inhibitors are a relatively new category of medications available for PD. They act on particular neurons in the brain to enhance dopamine signaling. MAOB inhibitors inhibit the breakdown of dopamine within the brain to allow it to signal for longer. And amantadine, immediate and extended release versions, act in more than one way to improve PD symptoms. For many people, it is very important for medications to be taken on time. Missing a dose or being late for a dose can greatly affect symptoms. 
If it is unclear to a person with PD how their medications are affecting symptoms, that person may be advised to keep a diary, which keep tra keeps track of medication timing and symptoms. The neurologist will review the diary to try to determine how best to change medications to improve symptoms. APDA has developed a symptom tracker mobile app, which helps people with PD keep track of their symptoms. You can download this app for free on App Store or Google Play. We will now discuss another integral component of PD treatment, physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Physical therapy improves balance, walking, and strength. Speech therapy improves speech and swallowing difficulties. And occupational therapy improves fine motor skills and promotes independent living. Another approach to treating PD is through surgery. Deep brain stimulation, or DBS, is a surgical procedure in which a wire is placed deep within the brain and then tunneled under the skin and attached to an implantable pulse generator in the chest. This IPG can be controlled to deliver electricity to the deep parts of the brain that regulate the circuitry that is not working properly in PD. Deep brain stimulation can be helpful for those who do not get consistent improvement from their medication doses. Besides the treatments that healthcare community will provide, you are an important part in managing the disease and living well. Exercise is an essential part of living well with PD. Exercise can help manage symptoms and improve quality of life. Being sedentary and deconditioned can increase stiffness, stooped posture, and promote poor endurance. The Center for Disease Control recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week for all older adults. So consider the four different types of exercise in your regular exercise program, and these include aerobic, strengthening, stretching, and balance. Diet is another element of your lifestyle that you can control. Despite numerous clinical trials of various nutritional supplements, no specific supplement has been proven to help PD. However, here are some key principles regarding PD and nutrition. Be aware that for some, dietary protein can compete with levodopa to cross the small intestine, making medication doses less effective. If this is a problem for you, you may need to adjust your intake of protein during the day. Constipation, which is a common non-motor symptom of PD, can be treated with plenty of fluids, specific foods, and regular exercise. Low blood pressure, another common symptom in PD, can be treated with fluids and liberalization of dietary salt. Weight loss can complicate PD but can also be a sign of other medical conditions. So talk with your doctor if you are experiencing weight loss. Brain health may be enhanced by adherence to the Mediterranean diet, and this diet is rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes such as beans, peas, and lentils, nuts, low-fat proteins such as fish and poultry, and olive oil. A team approach to your healthcare is essential with you at the center. A movement disorder specialist is a neurologist who has undergone additional training in Parkinson's disease and related disorders. Consulting with a movement disorder specialist can help you achieve the best medical management of your PD. Your movement disorder specialist can partner with many other healthcare professionals to help you in your PD journal journey. Seeking out support from your friends, family, and community is also essential. APDA can help you live your best life with PD. Every day, we provide the support, education, and research that will help everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease live life to the fullest. We are here for you. APDA has three areas of focus. Information on referral. We help people get connected to the care they need. Education and support. We help equip people with the information they need to understand PD and health and wellness. We help people get moving in ways that are specifically designed for people with PD. And we have chapters and, and information on referral centers across the United States, bringing information and programming to you. But no matter where you live, APDA is here for you. Because in addition to the resources we have across the US, we can connect with anyone, anywhere, through our extensive website and our toll-free number. For example, there's a tremendous amount of useful content on our website, including information about the disease itself, education and support, 
details about the research we, we fund, and more. We have an extensive list of free publications on our website available for download, or you can order hard copies mailed to you. APDA has created a spotlight on Parkinson's webinar series, which are all archived on our website for you to view whenever it's convenient for you. Here are a number of resources that you can find on our website, apdaparkinson.org, to help you continue in your understanding of Parkinson's disease. In addition to programming that we provide to people with PD, we fund research focused on bringing new treatments to people with PD and ultimately finding a cure. The bottom line is that APDA is here for you. Our tagline is strength and optimism, hope and progress, which speaks to the work we do every day. You can contact our chapter or information on referral centers directly. And of course, you can always reach out to us on our national toll-free number, 1-800-223-2732, or contact us online. Follow us on social media so you can stay up to date on our latest news and events. And of course, if you'd like to get more involved or support AD APDA with a donation, we certainly welcome that support as we cannot do our work without you. Thank you so much for listening.